This video will provide a concept overview of the major topics covered in Chapter 9, Forecasting and Demand Planning. Forecasting is simply defined as the process of projecting the values of one or more variables into the future. Good forecasts are needed in all organizations to drive analyses and decisions related to operations, whereas poor forecasting can result in poor inventory and staffing decisions, resulting in part shortages, inadequate customer service, and many customer complaints. The problem is that, while a number of quantitative methods are used, forecasting is hardly an exact science. No single model is perfect, and usually human judgment is combined with the quantitative methods, making forecasting both a science and an art. Forecasting can be done for a number of planning horizons. A planning horizon is simply the length of time in which a forecast is based, and there are generally three planning horizons. There's short term, which is typically up to three months out, intermediate, which is typically between three and twelve months, and long-range forecasts and look up to 10 years or more into the future. Different types of operations management decisions are made in each of the planning horizons. For example, scheduling typically falls into the short range, inventory and production planning into the intermediate range, and major capacity and location decisions would fall in the long-range horizon. There's also something we call a time bucket, which is simply the unit of measure for the period used in the forecast. We can forecast for an entire year, month, week, or even minute, depending on what we want to forecast. For example, Ford might forecast auto sales by month, and a steel manufacturer might forecast power consumption by the minute. Most forecasts rely on past or historical data to help predict the future. Forecasts that rely on historical data are known as time series forecasts. A time series is a set of observations measured at successive points in time or over successive periods of time. Time series data usually relates to the time bucket. For example, Ford has a rich historical set of sales data on the F-150 trucks by month stretching back decades. DQ can access daily sales of peanut butter parfaits for a location since the store first opened. Time series data may also have an underlying pattern of growth or decline. We call this a trend, and a trend can either be linear or nonlinear. Here are examples of a decreasing and increasing linear trend tracking volume, usually in units, over time. Linear implies a constant trend of decline or growth and assumes it will continue perpetually and are usually represented visually as straight lines. Nonlinear increasing and decreasing trends appear visually as curves and not as straight lines. This means the growth or decline is not constant and volume may accelerate or decelerate exponentially over time. Seasonal patterns are repeatable time periods of ups and downs over short periods of time. Retail sales typically follow repeatable seasons over a year. Cyclical patterns in a data series are those that take place over long periods of time. Cyclical patterns may mimic the economic cycle, for example. Sometimes sales of products follow a completely unexplained deviation from a predictable pattern, resulting in random variation. Here the data is usually a mess which makes forecasting very difficult, whereas identifiable trans seasonal patterns and cyclical patterns make forecasting easier. Finally, there's irregular variation in sales data, which is a one-time explainable event. We sometimes call these outliers. For example, an unseasonably warm day in December can cause an unexpected spike in frappuccino sales at Starbucks. Forecasting is both the science and an art, and tries to come up with our best guess of product or service demand, but in the end it's just that, a guess. And that means our guesses are rarely perfectly accurate, and therefore subject to error. A forecast error is the difference between the observed value of the time series and the forecast. Forecast errors are used to compare different forecast models using the same time series data to help select an optimal model. In OM, we employ three different types of forecast errors. First, there is the mean squared error, or MSE, which is calculated by squaring the individual forecast errors and then averaging them over all the t-periods of data in the time series. Squaring helps highlight the magnitude of errors between observed and forecast values and helps to compare different models. Next is the mean absolute deviation, or MAD. This is simply the average of the sum of the absolute deviations for all the forecast errors. Here's where we might say that, on average, our forecasted values differ from actual hourly coffee sales by an average of plus or minus 10. Finally, the mean absolute percentage error, or MAPE, is simply the average of the percentage error for each forecast value in the time series. Here we might say that, on average, our forecasted values differ from actual hourly coffee sales by plus or minus 3%. Operations managers engaging in forecasting usually subject the time series data to some basic statistical forecasting methods. Statistical forecasting assumes that the future will be an extrapolation of the past. 
We need to make this assumption because otherwise historical time series data would be useless. A very common statistical forecasting method is the good old simple moving average, which takes an average of the most recent number of observations. We can calculate a 3-month, 4-month, or 5-day moving average if we want. This puts more weight on the most recent set of data. If we try to use a 12-month or 36-month moving average, the forecast becomes so smooth and will usually give high errors. We can also employ simple exponential smoothing, or SES, which is a weighted average of past series data based on the smoothing constant, or alpha, that puts higher or lower weight on the most recent period's actual demand. Alpha ranges between 0 and 1, or between 0% and 100%. For example, if we're forecasting daily sales of pies and we apply a smoothing constant of 1 or 100%, that means tomorrow's forecasted pie sales will equal today's actual pie sales. Clearly, we wouldn't want to set a smoothing constant so high because it isn't very helpful. Common smoothing constants range between 0.05 and 0.5. An alternative to basic statistical forecasting is regression. Regression analysis is a method for building a statistical model that defines a relationship between a single dependent variable and one or more independent variables. For example, cold temperatures could affect the sales of hot chocolate. In this case, hot chocolate sales would be the dependent variable, which depends on temperature or the independent variable. For our purposes, we adapt simple linear regression to be based on time period and use the least squares method. You may be familiar from your middle school or high school math with this formula, y equals a plus bt, or some variation of it. Here, the forecast value, yt, is assumed to depend on the time period, t, where time period could be a week or a month. So if we have 12 weeks of historical data, that's t periods 1 through 12, we can then forecast period 13, 14, all the way up to period 52, or week 52, using that equation. And then there's multiple linear regression which is the model that likes to identify causal relationships with more than one independent variable. For example, sales could be affected by the week and price. Sometimes number-based or quantitative forecasts are simply not appropriate. Perhaps there's not enough time series data, or the data is a mess and there's no visible trend or cycle. That's when we need to rely on the human factor, and that's where forecasting becomes a bit of an art. Judgmental forecasting relies on the opinions and expertise of people in developing forecasts. And there are two common types of judgmental forecasts. The first is grassroots forecasting, where we ask people close to the end consumer, like salespeople, about customers' purchasing plans. Of course, this information is only as good as what the customers say, and customers do tend to change their minds, so this isn't always the most reliable source of information, but it's better than nothing. Then there's the Delphi method, where forecasting is done by expert opinion by gathering judgments of key personnel based on their experience and knowledge of the situation. Here's where we rely on experts who have their fingers on the pulse of the business and its customers. In the end, forecasting is a combination of imperfect science and art to help us come up with our best guess about what to expect, and there are 10 helpful general principles that can guide our approach to forecasting to come up with the best guesses we can. First, ideally we want to rely on hard, observable, provable, quantitative rather than qualitative data, which is highly subjective and prone to bias. Second is to limit subjective assessments to quantitative forecasts. Adjusting time series data for the odd outlier is fine, however mucking around too much with the data and massaging quantitative forecasts can render them less reliable. Third is to adjust for events expected in the future. Time series data captures only what has happened, and we rely on that data to project the future, assuming it will resemble the past. But if we know something's going to happen that will likely affect the future, and then it's not reflected in the historical data, then we should account for it. Fourth is to ask experts to justify their forecasts in writing, so we have a record of the rationale provided. Humans are inherently forgetful, and we need to record our assumptions so we can determine if they were valid. Fifth is to use structured approaches to integrate judgmental and quantitative forecasts. This ensures we don't randomly come up with ways to integrate methods and makes the approach repeatable in the future. Six is to combine forecasts from different approaches. For example, putting both seasonal and trend projection forecasts together can result in a better model than each on its own. Seventh, if we do combine forecasts, begin with equal weights and then adjust accordingly. Eighth is to compare past performance of various forecasting models to help select the optimal model and anticipate that the same model might not be appropriate for forecasting all products. For example, different products may exhibit different demand patterns, and a weighted average approach might work best for one, whereas regression might be more appropriate for another. Ninth is to seek feedback about forecasts. 
and lasts us to use multiple measures of forecast accuracy, such as MSE, MED, MAPE, and even a tracking signal to compare methods and select the best model. A tracking signal is a method for monitoring forecasts by quantifying bias. Bias is simply the tendency of forecast to be consistently larger or smaller than the actual values of the time series. For example, our forecast may appear to be consistently lower than actual demand. The tracking signal is the sum of cumulative differences of the individual and forecasted values divided by the mean absolute deviation. Ideally, a tracking signal is within plus or minus four mean absolute deviations, or MADs. The purpose of forecasting is to help predict future demand for goods and services, and then it drives everything else from capacity development and production to scheduling and post-sales support and service. So having useful and accurate forecasts is imperative. Forecasting is a crucial yet imperfect combination of quantitative methods tempered by even more imperfect human judgment, guesses, and bias. Right now, it's the best we have, but it's better than nothing at all.